Good evening, everybody. Good evening. It's always good to be in the house of God. Amen. It's always good to be able to stand up here and preach also and try to teach uh, what I learned from the Bible. It's, it's a great honor for anybody to, to read God's Word in front of anybody, especially when we go out sowing, stuff like that. And uh, I know this is not Wednesday, but we're still going to be in the Psalms. We're going to be in Psalm 16. Psalm 16 is one of the greater psalms. It has no title to it. The reason I believe it doesn't have a title to it is, is because it could be anybody's psalm. Anybody could be this, and it's, it's, it's a great psalm, one of my favorites. And uh, if there's a title to this message that I could give tonight, it would be The Love of My Life. The Love of My Life. And in verse 1, it reads, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me. Therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. So as long as I live, God will be the love of my life. Because I will call upon him as long as I live. If you would, turn to Micah chapter 7. While you're there, you know, everybody, or while you're going there, everybody should ask themselves, who is the love of your life? For most people, it's their spouse. It's, there's nothing wrong with that. A lot of people, it's, you know, their kids or their family. Most unsafe people, it's going to be their TV, but nowadays, this is the love of everybody's life. You know, you can't find anybody without their phone in their face because the whole world revolves around their phone. But in Micah, chapter 7, in verse 5, it says, Trust ye not in a friend. Put ye not confidence in a guy. Keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. For the son dishonoreth the father, and the daughter riseth up against her mother, and the daughter in law against her mother in law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. Therefore, I will look unto the Lord, I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. See, we love our families. There's nothing wrong with that. The, the Bible teaches us to love our families. But our families can't save us. Our families will forsake us. Our brothers, as we learned this morning, could even so much as try to kill us. You know, but there's one who we can always trust. And that's the Lord. If you would, go to Matthew chapter 10. While you're going there, I'm going to read Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. It says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. In Ephesians 5, 33, it says, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. In Ephesians chapter 6, in the very next chapter, in verse 1, it says, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. In verse 2, the fifth commandment, it says, Honor thy father and thy mother. It's talking to a family, to be a family. You know, husbands are supposed to love their wives. Wives are supposed to reverence their husbands. Children are supposed to obey their parents. But do we really need verses to tell us these things? Well, we do because everybody changes. I couldn't tell you how many people I've known that had the perfect life with the perfect wife, the perfect kids, and you would never think in a million years, oh, they're going to break up, or she's going to do him wrong, or he's going to do her wrong. Then five years later, you find out that they hate each other. And you would have never thought in a million years that one would forsake the other, but they do. 
So nobody is beyond forsaking each other or doing people wrong because we're all sinners. We all are wrong. We all can betray each other. But there's one who never betrays. In, in Matthew chapter 10, and if you're in the Pew Bible, it's on page 1356. In case you guys having trouble finding it. And we're going to be in verse 36 of Matthew chapter 10. It says, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest... Oh no, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong page. Let me start over. It says, And a man, man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. See, if we put all our trust in our family, and we put our whole lives loving our families and forsaking the Lord, then we're just headed for a total destruction. Because it says, a man's foes are they of his own house. Even though you think somebody's heart is pure towards you, you don't know their heart. Everybody, everybody changes. You know, what somebody says today isn't necessarily what they're going to do tomorrow. So there's only one we can trust. And that's, and that's God himself. In Matthew 10, 21, it says, And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child. And the children shall raise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. You know, we learned that this morning, that even your own brother, somebody that you think and fully trust, can turn on you and even so much as put you to death. So we can't put our trust in our families. We love our families. I love my family more than anything that I can think of except for the Lord. You know, but we never know what tomorrow's going to bring. If you would, go to Jeremiah 31. That's page 1111 in the uh, Pew Bible. While you're headed there, I want to read uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. And everybody has heard this. Everybody knows this by heart. If you've ever read the Bible, it says, For he had said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. See, our families will leave us and forsake us. We can't put our trust in them. But we can always trust in the word of God because he said, For he said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. When we make God the Lord of our life, when he is the love of our life, he will never leave us or forsake us no matter what we do. In Jeremiah 31, 3, it says, The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Everlasting love from God is everlasting. Because he will never leave us nor forsake us because his love is an everlasting love. We can love people here on the earth, but the everlasting love that we have is from God. Back in Psalm 116, in verse 3, and by the way, that's page 907 in your pew Bible. In verses 3 through 8, it says, the sorrows of death come past me, and the pains of hell get hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. 
I was brought low, and he helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. See, so this psalm starts out, the Lord is the love of his life. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. See, this is a psalm of salvation. And it's a sal psalm of salvation for everyone. And what we should do when we get saved. So we're going to keep on reading. In verse 9 it says, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. If you would, uh, go to Ephesians chapter 2. And that's on page 1645 in the Pew Bible. Ephesians chapter 2. In verses 4 through 6, it says, But God, who was rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together. And made us to sit, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. See, in the psalm, he's talking about how he got saved. And this right here, when it says, I will walk in the land of the living. Here in Ephesians, it says, when we get saved, we already have a place in heaven. It says, and hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The moment we get saved, we already have a place in heaven. If you would uh, go to Jan Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1 it says and at that time shall Michael stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since was a nation even to that same time thy people shall be delivered everyone that shall be found written in the book and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. See, so we're all wise here, but not everybody is. A lot of people is not going to shine as the stars forever and ever. But we can take this verse and it says, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. The Bible says that there's five crowns that we can attain. You know, but it never says anything about this crown. Because we're going to shine as stars forever and ever because we're out there every day turning many people to righteousness. Every time we go soul winning, we lead somebody into righteousness, whether we know it or not, just by giving them the gospel. And we're going to shine as stars forever and ever. But in verse 2 it says, Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life. And see, getting saved is everlasting life. The moment we get saved, we have an everlasting place in heaven. And it's already there waiting for us. 
You know, Jesus is there waiting for us now. If you would, go back to Ephesians in chapter 1. But keep a place in Psalm 16, if you would, because we're going to be switching back and forth. In Ephesians chapter 1, in verse 13, this is one of the greatest verses in the Bible when it comes to soul winning, and we don't use it a lot when we're soul winning. I think I used it uh, one time yesterday, but it says, and who ye also trusted? After that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. What this is saying is, the moment you believe, you are saved. There's nothing complicated about salvation. It's the moment you believe, you are saved. You don't have to get saved and go to church to get saved. Or you don't have to believe and then go to church and get saved. You don't have to believe and then do other works. It says the moment you believe. It says, in whom also you trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. People want to argue with us and say that we can't go out and get somebody saved in 10 minutes. I have to agree with them because it doesn't take 10 minutes. The moment somebody believes in Jesus, they're saved in what he did. So getting saved, you know, isn't hard for somebody to do to another person. You can get anybody saved. Psalm 16, if you could say there in uh, Zechariah chapter 8, but in Psalm 16, in verse 10, it says, I believe, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. It says, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Psalm 16 says four times I call upon the name of the Lord. When we believe, all we have to do is call upon the name of the Lord. We say that every day when we're out soul and That's all it takes. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father, which is in heaven. But in Zechariah chapter 8, verse 16, it says, These are the things that ye shall do. Speak ye every man the truth to his neighbor. Execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates. And let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor. And love no false oath. See, back in Psalm 116 and verse 11, it says, I said in my haste, all men are liars. And that's easy to do because we look around here and we see these empty pews. But we've, in the past year, been out soul winning. And a lot of people haven't kept, kept count, but I've kept a pretty close count. And we've gotten over 200 people saved in this past year, and that's a lot of people. Most churches that I've been to, 
I've never got 200 people saved the whole time their church has been open. But we've done that in a year, but look around, there's nobody here. So it's easy to, for us to say, I said in my haste, all men are liars. Because a lot of people say, well, you didn't get them saved because there's nobody in your church. But according to the word of God, the moment you believe you're saved, there's nothing about going to church that gets you saved. We just come here to fellowship and learn more about God. And God is the love of our life. That's why we're here. You know, so when this says, I said in my haste, all men are liars, we should never say that. And over there in Zechariah chapter 8, it says, And let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor, and love no false oath. See, it's not up to us to call men liars and say they didn't get saved. It's not up to us to say that person can't get saved. It's not up to us to say, well, I'm not going to witness to that person because of this or that. You know, because we don't know their heart like, like God does. Right. You know, so all we can do, like it says in this psalm here, is in verse 13, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. We don't know who God's people is because God sees the hearts we don't. So even though we may think somebody that's a reprobate and it's evil, it's not up to us to say they cannot get saved. Naturally, the Bible says to keep away from all appearances of evil. And the Bible says that we should love the good and hate the evil. So we just stay away from the evil. We don't go looking for it. But when we have the opportunity to give somebody the gospel, we can't say all men are liars. We just give them the gospel and let God water that seed. At the end of Zechariah, chapter 8, 17, he lets us know that. Because it says, And let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his name. And love no false oath. For all these things, for all these are things that I hate, saith the Lord. See, we can't imagine evil against anybody. And we can't imagine our hearts against our neighbor. And we love no false oath. You know, because God hates that. It says it right there. If you would go back to uh, Ephesians chapter 4. I meant to tell you to keep my hand in but I yeah. In Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians 4 is just one page over. If you're there, it's in verse 21.
can't tell you how many times somebody walked up behind me and said, hey, I like your shirt. And I'm like, really? Do you know for sure you're going to heaven? Or people will say, I like my shirt, and I'll tell them what that verse means. And when I go out soul winning, I don't carry a little New Testament and put it in my back pocket. I carry a full-size Bible. And the reason why I do that is not because I want to carry around a big Bible and look like I'm uh, holy. It's because I couldn't tell you how many times I've been walking down the street and somebody said, hey, are you a preacher? Yes, I am. Do you know for sure you're going to heaven? I was out soul winning in Kentucky uh, about a year ago, and I was done soul winning. I was on my way back to the van. And I was walking by the path past the houses that I already knocked, and there was two guys sitting there, and they were hoodlums, you could tell. And they must have just pulled up. And uh, they were sitting there, and you could tell it was pretty sad. And they looked up there, and they, they seen me, and they seen this Bible on my hand. Without this Bible, I would have been just any other person, just walking by the way. But they was like, are you preaching the word? I said, yes, I am. So I walked up to them. I can't say that they got saved, but they got the full gospel. And they believed that they was beyond getting saved because they'd done so much bad. Like I said, they was, they was hoodlums. They was in a gang. They was pretty tough guys. But I got to give them the gospel for one reason. It's because I had this Bible in my hand walking down the street. I can't put this Bible in my pocket. I have to carry it. So people say, when well, you carry that big Bible, you know, just to show people, you know, I'm this or I'm that. No, I carry this Bible so people know exactly what I'm doing. They see this Bible when I knock on their door. It gives them the chance not to open the door. I don't want to talk to those people anyways because I don't want to talk to the people down the street that see this Bible. And they say, hey, he's a preacher. I'm going to open the door to him. So when you knock on somebody's door and you don't have a Bible in your hand, they don't know who you are. They see this black book. They say, hey, you know, he's, he's here to invite me to church or teach me some kind of false gospel or something. But they still, they respect this Bible. And they open the door. Or they don't want to hear you, they won't open it. Either way, it's a win-win. That's why I carry a big Bible when I go soul winning. But you know, that was a regular trip. If you would, uh, turn to chap uh, Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, I will confess, is my second favorite story in the Bible. My second favorite story in the Bible. And it's uh, the story of what we call Legion. His name wasn't Legion, but I call him Legion because that's the only we had to identify him. And this is my motivation for soul winning. Uh, a lot of people say that they want to go soul winning because they love people. There's nothing wrong with that. I wish I was more like that. Chris is a perfect example. I wish I was more like Chris sometimes. But my motivation is not because I love people. My motivation comes from Luke chapter 8 right here. Uh, when we read the story about Legion. In verse 38, it says, Now the man out of whom the devils were departed besought him that he might be with them. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to thine own house, and show how great things God hath done unto thee. And he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. See, Jesus was betrayed by one of his disciples. Then he was arrested. They spit on him. They beat him, they blindfolded him, they punched him in the head while he was blindfolded and put a crown of thorns on his head. They put him on a cross and crucified him. All his friends forsook him. His best friend denied him three times. You know, Jesus died on the cross, but before he did, after they beat him, spat on him, crucified him, they all forsook him. He just said, Father, please forgive me. You know, he didn't, he could have had legions of angels come and take him down and kill all those uh, wicked people. But he just said, Father, please forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's the love of Jesus. And 
Jesus did all that to save my soul. And the only thing he ever asked me to do is, hey, go sell somebody else what great things Jesus did for you. And he says it over and over again. And, uh, you know, the end of Matthew says, go in the world and teach all nations. And Mark, chapter 16, 15, it says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. When he came back and he talked to Peter, he said, Peter, do you love me? He says, yeah, I love the Lord. He said, feed my sheep. That's all he wanted you to do. You make God the love of your life. You got one mission, and that's to feed his sheep. Like I was saying earlier, it doesn't take much to get somebody saved. All you have to do is give them the gospel. All you have to do is tell them what Jesus did for them. Jesus himself even said it. He says, return to thine own house and show how great things God hath done unto thee. That's all you have to do to get somebody saved. How did you get saved? You got saved because Jesus died on the cross for you. He took all that punishment and all your sin and laid it on himself. And all he wants you to do is tell somebody else what he did for you because he did it for them also. It's not that hard to get somebody saved. Just tell them Jesus loves them. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him and go to church. No, it doesn't say that. It says whosoever believeth in him should not perish everlasting life. There's no small print underneath that verse, and I say that every time I'm out slowly, because everybody wants to add to it, everybody wants to make it complicated. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, it says, the simplicity that is in Christ. It is so simple, it's us that complicate it. Getting saved is as easy as just believing. You know, I believe that wall's white. How hard is that? It's that easy to get saved. I believe that Jesus died on the cross, to save my soul. And you can get anybody saved just by telling them that. All they have to do is believe it. If you would, go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. That's page 1669 in the Pew Bible. chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. See, Paul's saying the same thing here as it says in Zechariah 8. It says, pray for all men. You know, we can't say, well, that person can't get saved, or I'm not going to give that person the gospel. You know, I wear my shirt. A lot of times I've given the gospel to somebody standing in line at the gas station. You know, I've been pumping gas before and preaching the gospel just because I have a shirt on. You know, that's why I wear, uh, carry the big Bible. I wear the godly shirts or the spiritual shirts. You know, not because I want somebody to say, oh, he's, you know, spiritual. It's because it gives me a chance because somebody always says, hey, I like your shirt. You know, we should try to get everybody saved that we can. And 
in Psalm 16, that's what he's teaching. But before we go back there, I'm going to read you a quote from Charles Spurgeon. A lot of people in the IFB don't like Charles Spurgeon because they say he's a uh, uh, Calvinist. Charles Spurgeon is the one who wrote the book, The Soul Winner. I've never heard a Calvinist go on Soul Winner. He wrote a book called The Soul Winner. It's a pretty good book. I have one. And this is a quote from Charles Spurgeon. It says, If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions. And let not one go unwarned and unprayed for. Not one. He says if they're going to go to hell, make sure they go to hell with your arms wrapped around their knees trying to get them to stay. That means give them the gospel every chance you get, every chance you get. And it doesn't say these people or those people. It just says all men. And that's a great quote. I, I've got it written in my Bible. You know, and that's from Charles Spurgeon, the man who is a Calvinist, who believes only some people are going to heaven. But he says right here, let not one go unwarned and unprayed for. You know, how's that for a Calvinist? Doesn't make sense to me. You know, he lived back in the uh, early 1800s. You can say anything you want to about him now. But this is a quote that he wrote, and he wrote the book Soul Winner. See you. I just thought I'd throw that in. In 1 Timothy, two and verse. I'm sorry. Back in Psalm 116, verse 19. So I'm always ready 
to pay my vows unto the Lord right now in the presence of all his people. If I go somewhere without my Bible, how am I going to give them the gospel? I can just tell them my words. They may believe me, but when they see it in the Bible, there's something special about that. Because it's God's written word. You know, the Bible says, Lo, I come, and the volume of a book is written of me to do thy will, O Lord. You know, this book is Jesus. We've all heard John 1. I preached that last time I preached. In the beginning was the word. Verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. This is the word right here. This book is Jesus. The Bible says that we have the mind of Christ. Well, it's right here. So I never go anywhere without it. I'm not saying I won't forget sometimes, but I typically always take it with me. But back in verse 19, in Psalm 116, it says, In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of thee, O Jerusalem, praise ye the Lord. In Psalm 84, 10, it says, For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Amen. And that's why I come to churches every time I, every time I can. That's why every time I get a chance, Try to do something for God. Not for me. That's why I will never say no if Brother Ted asks me to preach. That's why I'll never say no if somebody asks me to go soul winning. So I'll never say no if somebody wants me to give them the gospel. It doesn't matter who they are. And I just love that. That verse that says, For a day in thy court is better than a thousand. It doesn't say house, it says court. It said, I had rather been a, be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Can you imagine being a doorkeeper in the house of God? Well, that's what we are every time we go so many because we open that door. Jesus is the door, but we just need to show them how to knock. You know, and that's what this psalm is. In verse number one, Psalm 116, it says, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. And in verse 14, it says, I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. In verse 18, it says, I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. See, he loves the Lord because the Lord saved his soul. And his vows that he's going to pay to the Lord is to tell everybody he can how they can get saved also. That's what Psalm 116 is about. I was telling Ruth one day, we was talking about how to get people saved without the verses that we normally use. I said, just go to Psalm 116. Psalm 116 says four times, I then call I upon the name of the Lord. You know, he's not quoting, but in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, we say that every time we're out soul winning. It says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In Acts 22, 21, it says, for then shall, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall get saved. In Genesis chapter 4, I believe, could be wrong, it says, then begin men to call upon the name of the Lord. Well, it says it four times here. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. You know, that's all we have to do to get somebody saved. God saved us. All he wants us to do is get somebody else saved. Every chance we get. That's all I have. So let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for letting me you preach your word. I hope I did it rightly. I pray that everyone who heard me tonight will Take this message and put it in their hearts to get somebody else saved. At any cost that it might cost them. Whatever it takes. To tell all the people about you and how great things that you have done for them. I pray that you be with everyone tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.